So here we are at the Oxo Tower in London for the first annual Encounter Oregon MW and MW Student Seminar. On the panel, we will have David Adelsheim from Adelsheim Vineyard, Eugenia Keegan from Jackson Family Wines, and Kate Norris from Division Wine Company. The panel will be moderated by Master of Wine, Lenka Sandlokova. I was very fortunate uh, last year to take part in the MW trip to Oregon and Washington, which was really exciting um, and really eye-opening. So we tried some really, really interesting wines in Oregon, and uh, it um, really changed my opinion about the region. I probably didn't have as much of an opinion about it before, but I certainly do now, and uh, it's a very high opinion. So I'm very excited about this, um, about this seminar. Um, as you, you can probably see, we have some red wines in the glass, so we will, we will give you a slight overview of, of Oregon, of the climate, um, of the geology, and then we are going to dive into Pinot Noir um, before we look at Chardonnay and Pinot Gris. So I guess I'll, uh, we'll start off with, uh, with the first slide. So where in the world is Oregon? I think most of you, most of you know um, where Oregon is. Um, latitude between 42 and 46 degrees north. So if you want to compare it with um, European winemaking regions, it's um, similar to Bordeaux, which is 44.8. Uh, Burgundy is 47, or Bone is 47 degrees. Um, these are the wine producing regions of the West Coast, very self-explanatory. Um, now, Oregon. Oregon has 18 AVAs. Um, it shares three with um, Washington, and that's Walla Walla, um, Columbia Valley, and Columbia Gorge. And it also shares one with uh, Idaho, and that's the uh, Snake River Valley. Oregon, a bit about the Oregon wine industry, and this is, I guess, we can, we can talk about this in a bit more detail. So there are currently around 700 wineries in Oregon, and um, around 1,100 different vineyards. And as you can see from this slide, um, the number is growing. So I guess um, what I would like to know from, from the panel is um, where the early pioneers um, came to Oregon from California and from Burgundy. But where do you see the interest coming from now? Mm, California and Burgundy. Still. <laughs> I came from Oregon. You came from Oregon. Good. Uh, and I think... I think Oregon remains a place that people can start a business without having tons of money. I mean, you started your business. Exactly. So if you look at that chart right when it starts to peak or starts to spike, uh, I arrived in 2010 um, and a place where I could start uh, a winery or a winery uh, with you know, the money I had in my pocket, basically. Um, and there was opportunity not only in land, but also uh, in market, too. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, like in a certain sense, the big California purchases and Burgundians coming in get the headlines, but every year there are 20 or 30 new wineries and perhaps a few vineyards going in that don't get any headlines at all that are really either locals or people coming from someplace in the States or possibly from outside. I mean, there's, there's, Oregon has this mystique right now that is attracting people from all over. I think it's always had it. I think the pioneering aspect is something that we sort of continue to really celebrate, so. It's relatively affordable. I just bought a small piece of property and I could never have done that in Napa or Sonoma. Uh, where I was for 25 years making wine, but that was never an option, whereas Oregon is still an option to uh, buy a piece of property and plant a vineyard and actually establish some serious uh, roots for yourself. So it's still an available opportunity. How expensive is land in Oregon? What is the average cost of uh, a hectare an acre? I'm going to get in some trouble for answering this question. <laughs> but, um, it depends. It depends. Yeah. But <laughs> it depends. But you can still buy bare, bare land for... Ten or twelve thousand dollars an acre. Um, again, that's not translated. And uh, but you would see twenty twenty-five is quite normal if it's a producing vineyard of quality. It's going to be certainly sixty-five and up. I think we're starting to see some property opportunities that are more expensive than that. Certainly because we've we're hitting a, a, a time when uh, there's a little bit of cachet, but uh, it's still 
something you can you can get into with a few dollars. But at planting the vineyard, etc., is all the same. By the mm -hmm. way, that's there's no difference in the cost of planting a vineyard in Oregon than any other place. So it's all, that part costs the same. Well, but I also think that you can start a business without having a vineyard. Oh, and, and whereas when I started in 1971, in order to make wine, the first thing you had to do was buy a piece of property, plant grapes, wait until you had grapes coming off that property, and then you could make wine. Now you don't have to do that. I mean, there are enough people growing grapes and willing to sell them. Even wineries who have excess capacity, excess production are willing to do that. But Oregon remains a very small um, winemaking uh, region in terms of small properties, small small wineries, artisanal production. Yep, owner owner winemaker. Yeah, absolutely. Go back to that last slide. I yeah. mean, I think we have to remember that that Oregon still makes just less than one percent of the wine in the states, and that's it. That means that it is a rounding error mm. in the world production of wine, and it's it's why there is no real reason that anybody outside the U.S. even thinks about it, mm. uh, unless we bring it to their their attention. attention so, quite a lot of sustainable um, production in Oregon is very important to uh, to your to your industry. Definitely, and more and more so, I think also. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> and there are the traditional approaches of biodynamics and organics, but also there's been a, a big push since the late 90s to do something that is scientific-based sustainably, and excuse me, research-based sustainability. So not about just what you spray or what you don't spray, but also what is the effect of what you do in, your, in the entire property that you own and also in the winery that you make wine. So it looks at labor sustainability, it looks at, yes, what is sprayed, but that's not the only thing. I think part of it too is the, uh, which is a little bit of a ripoff from the biodynamic concept, but the whole property, the whole farm concept. Um, organics tends to look at what you're farming, which is grapes in our case, but um, we try and borrow the whole farm biodiversity <coughs> concept as well. So. Um, you're looking at all the critters that come across your property, all the other things that grow, and how to maintain a ecosystem at your entire property. It's not just about the uh, grapes in our case. And let's look at the wine growing throughout or Oregon. So Willamette Valley is the is the heart of uh, of the Oregon wine industry, but there's quite a lot of um, of uh, new plantings in southern Oregon, I believe, as well, and uh, that's that's growing. I think there are plantings in every, every one of the AVAs around the state, but clearly the Willamette Valley with something like 70 or 68 percent of the uh, wineries and vineyards, and well, I think even 70 percent of the vineyards, is really the focus. And it's really what, if you try wine in the UK from Oregon, it's very likely to be from the Willamette Valley. Uh, as you go south or as you go east, both of those places have warmer climates and can do varieties other than the Pinot and related varieties that have made the Willamette Valley famous. So as you go south, Tempranillo has established itself and Syrah and, uh, and all the Bordelais varieties. As you go east, it's really Bordelais varieties and Syrah as well once you get to eastern Oregon. And I guess if you back up to the uh, conversation about getting into the business, there, is, I was speaking to the Willamette Valley when I was giving you those prices, and the um, Southern Oregon, Applegate Valley, Eastern Oregon, there is enormous opportunity there for young winemakers or old winemakers, uh, but people that don't have a lot of money to spend. There is just an incredible opportunity to there in their beautiful areas, beautiful growing areas, just not as uh, as well established. Um, absolutely beautiful, the Applegate especially. Um, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I, uh, I, I get to make wine from that region. Uh, and it's the, the coolest of the southern, uh, southern area, basically. <laughs> Lovely coastal influence, granitic soils. Um, if you're staying for the next seminar, you'll get to try some of that wine too. So. Let's get into, we kind of touched on grape varieties, but uh, I think it's quite important to have a look at um, how much 
how important Pinot Noir is to Oregon. Um, currently 64% of all of the plantings, but this number is even higher in the Willamette Valley itself. So I guess my question is why, why Pinot Noir and why, why Oregon? What, what, were the fir what drew the first uh, pioneers to Oregon and to plant Pinot? I guess I get to do that. You're the, you're the, you're the pioneer. Lancaster. Yeah. Like yeah. She was like, who should I ask this question to? I'm like, mm, yeah, David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think at the very beginning, uh, a number of the people that uh, were the first, second, third people to plant grapes, David Lett, Chuck Corey, and Dick Erath, were looking for a pl They were in California. They were looking for a place to plant Pinot Noir. And they felt that there was no place in California that was cold enough to do that. I think we've subsequently found places, but their initial vision was, we need a colder place to plant Pinot Noir, and Oregon, the Willamette Valley, provided that. Um, initially, though, as, as, for instance, when we planted in 1971, we were part of this sort of ideal, idealistic and very naive movement that we wanted to found, start this new region, and we wanted to make fine wine. We wanted to make great wine. We didn't want to start making wine and make crappy wine. Um, so in order to make great wine, you needed the great grape varieties, and we felt that we were such a cool region that we would have to plant the grape varieties of Northern Europe, and there are basically three great grape varieties of Northern Europe, Chardonnay, Riesling, and Pinot Noir. <coughs> Uh, and in the beginning, uh, everybody planted somewhat close to one-third of each. But Riesling had the problem in the United States that it's always had, even to today, that it's not considered a serious wine uh, because it might have some residual sweetness. And so it's never taken off. Uh, Chardonnay had a different problem, and that is that we couldn't make the Chardonnay of the New World at that time, which had already been established. Uh, the bigger, riper, oakier, more alcoholic wines of warmer places. But there was no established style of New World Pinot in the, in the 60s and 70s. Literally, the only place that Pinot had any reputation at all, of course, was Burgundy and, and wasn't called Pinot. So Oregon slowly was able to establish itself and, and the percentage of Pinot went from roughly 35 to whatever it is today, but it's 72 in the Willamette Valley and in the North Willamette Valley where the clusters of, of wineries are, the majority of the wineries, it's 74%. I mean, the Cote d'Or, the Department of Cote d'Or is 70% Pinot. This is the highest concentration of Pinot planting anywhere in the world as far as we know, I think even including Central Otago. Yeah. Thanks very much. And we... Um I guess for this masterclass, when we were choosing, choosing the wines, um, I thought it might be a good idea to just focus on the Willamette Valley in this. And um, in particular, Pinot, we've got, we will get to Pinot in a, in a minute, just after we, we look at climate and geology. But um, Pinot is one of those great varieties that is best at expressing its terroir. And um, it is the best variety to really showcase the different, uh, different types of soil and the different AVAs within Willamette. So we, are, we have four Pinots in front of us uh, for that reason. And there are six um, nested AVAs within, um, within the Willamette, and we'll go through, e through each of them uh, a bit later on. Um, I guess first we have to look at <coughs> the climate of Oregon. And uh, Eugenia, you said you would kindly... Uh, talk us through, through this. Yeah, but I insisted on having the slides so that I didn't tell you whatever was coming to my mind. It wasn't exactly what would get you uh, good answers on your exams. Um, but I think that, that we, we, all, we work in a relative sense when we try and understand one point over another. And so we look at Burgundy and we look at California. And uh, uh, Burgundy is probably the stronger reference point for you. And for those of us from the States, California would be your first reference point. And uh, although there's a lot of reference to being at the 45th parallel, I'd like you to take that out of your head because that's uh, part of the a little bit more south than right through where we are here. Um, we're a little bit uh, closer to Burgundy. You know the 45th parallel doesn't go through Burgundy. I'm sure you know that. Um, and we're just north of that too. And the two things that distinguish us 
from both of the other areas is we have a similar uh, light, if you will, to what we have in Burgundy because of our northern uh, latitude. I get the right one of those, latitude, longitude. And um, so it's very important to understand that this distinguishes us from California in that we don't get the heat units, but we get the light units. And 15, 20 years ago, we didn't talk about heat and light as separate things when talking about climate. We really were talking about temperature without really understanding the influence of light. And that's been some of the research and knowledge that we've gained over time. So on June 20th, uh, the sun goes down at, uh, after 10 o'clock, whereas it's uh, an hour and a half or a little more uh, than that earlier in California. So where, we, where it which takes us longer to get warm in the springtime, like now, uh, California is already butted out down in Carneros in that area, and we're a long way from that. We end up with this light spike uh, in, in the end, end of June. And that um, morphologically has a big, uh, or physiologically, excuse me, has a big effect on those vines. And then you get to the uh, latter part and the uh, season where we're ripening. And that's where we are less like Burgundy and we have quite a bit of heat in those last two months. So July and August, um, we're at about 80 degrees, 81. Translate that for me, please. Into Celsius? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, about 27. And so we have very, very uh, warm days. We do have a reasonably strong diurnal, not as strong as uh, Northern California, but still there's a big swing. There's a big 20 degree swing going back and forth. And so we have cool nights uh, and warmer days that allows us to have ripe flavors, but we're still ripening in September uh, when we have most of our ripening. We are now cooler than California. And that's where we're, instead of some of the jammy components that we're used to from California wines, we have a lot more of the, what we would call fresh fruit, um, more like picking it off the, off the vine or off the tree, so much, much more fresh fruit. Yet plenty of sunshine to uh, take us to uh, full, full ripeness, but with higher acidity. And that, I think, is, is what, what separates our wines from either of those two growing regions. And uh, it's... Pretty, pretty blessed. These last few years have been quite warm, and um, most of us were very thrilled in 2017 when we pulled the temperatures back a little bit. We're, we're, we're very proud of the fresh fruit components that we have in our wines and uh, really fear too much, too much ripening. And uh, I guess in relation to rainfall, so there's, um, the amount of rain you get in Oregon is not dissimilar to Burgundy, but it all falls during the winter. Exactly. It? I think it's an important point. We have the same uh, rain curve as we have uh, all along the West Coast, so in California as well, where we, all of our rain is in the basically nine months. Uh, it feels like it's all this month if you're living there, but uh, we have it over a nine-month period, and then we have the three months of summer, and it is really dry all summer long. So although it rains later in the season and starts earlier in the season than you would in California, we still have that three-month very dry period uh, for ripening, whereas the Burgundian curve for, uh, for rainfall is essentially not a straight line, mind you, but basically all 12 months of the year, a very different rainfall pattern. Uh, Inch-wise or uh, uh, in terms of volume, it's about the same. I guess there is wind as well, which... Um in certain parts of the Willamette, like Eola Amity, is, is quite pronounced. And yeah, uh, there's, there's really a couple areas that are uh, very influenced by the wind, and you'll see coming up from the south, I think you can see there, we have a uh, gap in the mountain range. David will talk more about that, but we have the coastal range to the west and the Cascades to the east and, and the valley in between, and those mountains have an enormous effect. But there's a gap at the so southern end of the northern Willamette Valley, and a lot of afternoon wind comes in there uh, in the late, uh, late summer. And in fact, uh, we live a little north of that, and I um, had heard about the Van Duzer Corridor and those winds, and I didn't take them as seriously as I should have. And I was down there in August a few years ago. We have a big vineyard down in the, uh, down in the Eola Amity Hills. And uh, we were finished with a meeting at 5.30 in the afternoon and had a little dinner, and by 8.30 in the evening, standing outside, it was freezing. And I was in my shorts because it was probably 40 degrees out when we left that meeting at 
And I was outside in my shorts, and by 8.30, I was absolutely just like this. And I thought, oh my, we're having a weather pattern change. Got my car, drove 45 minutes north, got out of the car, and it was still 40 degrees. So it was all about that wind coming up through the Van Duzer corridor. You also get some, and that also influences not just the old Amity, but it influences the McMinnville AVA. Um, and then we get some westerly winds coming in that, um, again, those coastal mountains will sort of uh, break it up, and we happen to have a vineyard right there on the edge of the western boundary of, uh, of uh, Yamhill Carlton, and there the winds literally go over the top, and, but then if you get not but three or four miles and it starts to open up and the winds will start to influence that area. And what does that um, mean for, uh, for disease pressure? So the, the, the rain in the winter but dry summers and the wind, does that mean you have less disease pressure? We have or? less disease pressure, particularly mildew, uh, botrytis, the things that uh, are probably our worst enemies. Um, we certainly have less than you would have in, in uh, Russian River, as an example, where you have the fog that comes in every night. And it's one of the things not to confuse. That uh, fog that comes into Northern California, which influences its climate dramatically, we do not have nightly fogs that come in and then recede and then come in. And we don't have the, the moisture with that as well, which, which is an issue. Um, so in the Eola Amity, as an example, which has the influence of the corridor, we have quite a bit less pressure. So even when the two vineyards that I farm, one, one in Yamhill Carlton and one in Eola Amity, much more disease pressure up just a little bit north where we don't have quite the drying wind. So that's, that's actually uh, a big influence on disease. So would you it also say slows down ripening. It also yeah. slows down ripening. So you know, even though those vineyards will pace together all the way into the 1st of August, then that wind starts coming up and the ripening pattern on those two vineyards completely, they completely diverge. There's also um, a lot of wind that comes in from the gorge, which influences the uh, vineyards of eastern Oregon uh, to a great deal and dries those out, keeps them a uh, lot less uh, uh, disease pressure from, from coming from that area. Does it have a name? It's from the gorge. So the gorge the is Columbia the gorge. Columbia Gorge. Columbia gorge. Columbia yeah. gorge. Yeah. So all the influence from the Missoula floods and from the east came charging through that area. It actually, the river there divides Oregon from Washington. Uh, and that gorge, it's probably the, it's, I think it's the one of the two best um, kite surfing areas mm -hmm. in the world because of that wind that comes down that gorge uh, every afternoon as well. Same thing every afternoon. And then climate-wise, much drier in the gorge too. Much, much drier. Mm -hmm. So I guess... Warmer but drier. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk about irrigation? And uh, so in the Willamette Valley, is, are most vineyards dry grown? And do um, some I of the other areas have to use irrigation? And how does that tie into climate change as well? And, uh, yeah, um, I, I don't know the percent of irrigated vineyards. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it's really a, mostly it's a decision as a grower whether or not you want to irrigate. You can definitely dry farm. You do not need to irrigate in the Willamette Valley. I don't know if our friends from Southern Oregon would agree with that. Yeah, they're, they, uh, they're all irrigated. They're irrigated, um, so like uh, Northern California. In, uh, or at least it's set up. And yeah. it depends. Yeah, with a three-month drought, unless you have a plan for storage of water, you're not going to make it through. And in, in a place like Rogue Valley in southern Oregon, or certainly in, in the east where they don't even have that much rain to begin with, uh, they definitely would need to irrigate in, in order not to kill the vine. And then at soil type in terms of, I mean, just very well draining soils, and so no reserves for summertime in any way, shape, or form. But, but I think it's fair to say that for Pinot vineyards in the Willamette Valley, I mean, we, we once were very concerned that we were not getting enough water and that that was a problem. So we put in irrigation in a couple of our vineyards. And I remember one vintage where we irrigated to sort of based on the, the numbers that we were getting out of uh, leaf stress. And the wines were thin and anemic and we never irrigated again. Um, so I. I I literally don't know of anybody with a mature vineyard in the Willamette Valley that's irrigating Pinot. Um, I've had I, um, Armstrong Vineyard, so the Ribbon Ridge, there was uh, so two vintages ago, 
Mm -hmm. so, uh, 16, well, 15 actually. Mm -hmm. um, they turned the water on. They were having, uh, it's especially warm. Uh, for, for Pinot? For Pinot, yeah. yeah. Um, oh. uh, and then uh, you got some younger vines in the old Amity Hills just to get them started um, in yeah. a very dry year. But Certainly that's to start. Yeah. We, we will throw them on in some shallow soils, oh, so. um, depending. But what we don't do is use irrigation like you would in a warm climate. Um, my reference points are Northern California specifically. Whereas you, ha you need to start irrigating often in June or July to keep those vines paced all the way through the season. And certainly after verasion, you're going to see uh, irrigation on a routine basis. Whereas in Oregon, if we use it, it's when we see uh, 40 degrees coming up for three days. And we'll give those vines a little shot of water just to keep them vibrant and healthy and not stress them during that perhaps three period. So it's used more in response to the client as opposed to a prophylactic uh, farming management tool. I would say the majority of vines are not irrigated. Yep. Yeah. Do you find that, sorry, <clears throat> do you find that there's a different response based on clonal selection? So if you're using, let's say, Dijon clonal selection versus something different, do you find that they respond differently? No? No, I would, I would say age, age, of, age vine, of vine and soil, and soil type, yeah, are going to yeah. be much more influenced. And, and you could have a different response if we had a broader range of rootstock because rootstocks either go down or not so far down. And those that have required glar might actually need some sort of water because the roots don't, don't, don't go very deep. Can I just ask about that, Liza? Is the water supplied by uh, natural so rainfall and river? Um, there's no problem about salinity or? It's rainfall. Always, yeah. 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 Western Oregon has no salinity issue. Yeah. I wonder about Eastern Oregon if there is. I haven't heard of it. I haven't heard. No. Yeah. So we may have water in reservoirs, but it's still, it's all rain, rainwater. So this brings us to the geology of the Willamette Valley and the soils. And uh, David is kindly going to talk us through we're, it. We're so starting uh, with the entire Pacific. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I guess uh, setting the Let's scene. Let's start with New Zealand. Let's start, let's start over <laughs> on the left and the bottom. I think you're all, you're all aware <laughs> of the ring of fire and the, the ring of volcanoes. That, I, uh, I think the reason for this slide is that the Pacific, is, uh, as the Atlantic is getting wider, the Pacific is getting narrower. As the, as the continents move around, the Asia and, the, and North America are slowly getting closer and closer to each other. That's resulted in a buildup of land on the west coast of North America and in Asia. It's also the reason for why we have earthquakes on both sides of the Pacific, but not much of that on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but it also means that the West Coast is very new. 50 million years ago, there was no Oregon. It didn't exist. It was under the ocean. And as the Pacific got smaller, a number of islands were crashed into the West Coast. And slowly, that built up um, more of a seabed under which uh, sediment could, could uh, fall off the land that was still east by uh, 500 kilometers. And um, eventually, the subduction, sorry, I can't talk and use this. <laughs> do, you wanna, do you want me to hold the I microphone know, for you? <laughs> the subduction of, of uh, the Pacific under North America, so as, this, as the Pacific plate came in, it pushed up the west coast of North America. And so what was originally under the ocean was pushed up. And of course, because none of this is happening without all sorts of tectonic activity, there are lava flows, there are volcanoes, uh, there's a lot of activity, which is what that first slide was about. So the, the resultant mishmash of soils in the Willamette Valley are derived from three sources. The first is that oldest source, the sediment, the marine sedimentary soils that are, that are broken down really from what had come off the mountains and uh, accumulated under the ocean in the Pacific and then was eventually pushed up by that subduction. This, and that was sort of between 25 and 50 million years ago. More recently, uh, in the sort of 15, 17 million to 23 million years ago, 
there were math massive lava flows over the north of Oregon flowing from almost the Oregon-Idaho border covering up much of northern Oregon. And that lava was often as much as two kilometers deep uh, and flowed all the way to the ocean. And you can track that. You can see this Columbia River basalt all the way along northern Oregon. But that was long ago. 17 million years or 15 million years was probably the last time that, that lava flowed. And it has eroded often, uh, particularly where there's been a lot of rain. But where, the, where that lava has only partially eroded and you have soils from that volcanic material, it's very red. It's strikingly red, like in the Dundee Hills, Eola Hills, and a few other places, um, and makes for significantly different wine than what is in the sedimentary zone, uh, particularly because there's so much more clay in this volcanic soil it's much better at holding the summer rains, excuse me, the winter rains through the summer. And so there's much less chance of drought stress. And in most cases, not much reason to irrigate, except in, as Kate was saying, in the Ola Hills, it sometimes is so thin that there's not enough to really hold the rain that's needed. And then the most recent of these, um, That's uh, two and a half million years ago. Yeah. So that's, but that's the first, that's right? the yeah. Uh, no, okay. That's well, the less the less yeah. Mm -hmm. So so really the 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 third of the major vineyard soils is much closer to Portland, much closer to this Columbia Gorge, where winds after the last ice age basically brought uh, would sweep silt up off the valley floor and onto the mountainsides. And so there are a number of vineyard sites, particularly in the North Willamette Valley, the northern part of the North Willamette Valley, where the soil is basalt once you get under this luss, but the luss covers it. And we know from tastings as recently as uh, barely a week ago that these wines are significantly different if you have the, the luss coating than if you don't. So um, there, we know that the wines are different. What we don't know is what is the action of these soils that is causing it. Is it just water holding capability? Is it something about the chemical makeup? And how does that work since most geologists refute that that's possible? Um, so it's, it's still a, an area that needs to be researched. I was just going to ask, um, you say that they're different. Is that uh, regardless of the age of the vines, the older ones with deeper roots? Yes, even, even vines with, uh, I mean, at this tasting we did uh, nine days ago, uh, even the oldest vines that were planted 45, 46 years ago, um, th those, they were confused with, with wines from much, much more recently. And of course, we, we have to remember that almost as far as I know, everywhere in the world, 90% of the grape roots are in the top 30 centimeters or 40 centimeters. Even if roots go down further, most, particularly in a place that has rainfall, they don't need to go that deep all year long in order to get, in order to get water. And so the majority of what's going on is coming out of this 30 or 40 centimeter deep soil. And, and deeper is when you start to get second characteristics, basically, so additions. Um, and there's one more soil type. What, it's certainly the most soils. dramatic. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody tells the story about the Missoula floods, which, which also were happening a little after the, the major wind uh, action that resulted in Luss. Missoula floods were really the result of, uh, at the very end of the last ice age, which was whenever it says on the slide, because I can't remember. 18,000? Yeah. Okay. So, at some point, yeah, that's right, sort of 18, 20,000. At the end of the last ice age, there was a lake in Montana that was, that was plugged up by, uh, by the ice age glaciers. And as they melted and reformed, perhaps as many as 50 times, water would be released from this huge lake swoop, as you can see on this slide, 
over all of Eastern Oregon, be forced down the Columbia Gorge, fill up the Willamette Valley, because it was a tight opening out to the Pacific through the Coast Range. And so there was a lot of, of uh, material that was brought down from even as, as far east as Montana. We have in one of our vineyards a, a big boulder of black and white granite. There's no black and white granite in Oregon. That's a totally different geologic age. It came in on an iceberg from this Missoula flood process. And that's repeated over and over in other vineyards and other landscapes. And I guess with these... Oh, with and the, I'm sorry. And there are a few vineyards that are planted on the Missoula I was going floods. to say, because they're quite fertile but soils. So it's, it's, a, most it's no, it, Don't confuse it with the, uh, the alluvial soil on the valley floor. Because this is... When that soil was brought in, it filled up the Willamette Valley a bit like filling a bathtub. And so it left some soil, but the soil at the top of the hill would be eroded away, and at the bottom it would be covered by alluvial stuff that's happened since. So there's only a little band of Missoula flood soil. It's normally lower than most vineyards, but there are a few vineyards. The, the original Irie vineyard, for instance, has a bit of Missoula flood, and, and there are a few others. We have a couple of vineyards like that, too. It's not, it's not super vigorous. Um, but there's not enough to be able to get an idea of what it means. But if, if you see a vineyard that's planted on a hillside, there'll be part of it as you're working up the hill, part of it will be through some Missoula flood soil. But as you keep going up the hill, that soil will have dis been, been, it was only in the lower area. So even on one vineyard on a hillside, you can have two or three different layers of soil as you're going up that hill. So again, you've got elevation, having an influence, but you have the change in soil having an influence. So the vines at the top of the hill are clearly not the same as the vines at the And there's virtually the nothing planted on the valley floor. I mean, it's right. a very different place than, say, California or other New World places where the valley floor can be irrigated and is very good for growing grapes. There's nothing on the valley floor because it's so, it's so fertile that it, again, in the Willamette Valley, this is true, not, not necessarily elsewhere. It's so fertile that the vines are too vigorous, and to make the kind of wine that we're known for, it just doesn't work. But it's great for uh, blueberries and hazelnuts. So you'll see the valley floor is from which we make a lot. And hops. Yeah, and, and hops now too. Yeah, it's all yeah. it's all planted. It's very very fine farmland. It's just not appropriate for grapes. And I wanted to ask you as well about the pH um, of the soils because they're quite um, they're quite uh, acidic. Yeah. So what do you need to do in the vineyard, in the winery, to adjust uh, pH, do you? Nothing. So <laughs> we, we, had a, we had a grower who decided that they were going to make a big difference, and they, they got in all the big tractors you can imagine, and they dug everything down 20, 30 feet and spent untold <laughs> amounts of money on lime to change the soil. And of course it worked, there's no question about it. But it only works for a few years, unless, you can, unless you can stop the rain from coming down, <laughs> because it just leaches out and goes back to its natural state. So you're really not adjusting pH in your soil is really um, a, 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 you know, Sisyphusian uh, Early on, we chore. were told by the Burgundians. Uh, yeah. Early on, we were told by the Burgundians who would visit, well, there's no way you can plant Pinot Noir. I mean, you don't have calcare. Your pH is way too low. Uh, you'll be a total failure. You should plant Gamay. Um, which we all did, not <laughs> you. Um, Some people did. <laughs> <laughs> trying to, lead, trying to help. <laughs> Thank you. Lead you. P well, Pinot Noir, of course, reacts its own way, but uh, being someone that makes Gamay, um, the soils are actually make Gamay very happy. So, yeah. pH level. I, I, I think what it really means is that grapes generally, and Pinot particularly, is much more adaptable than mm -hmm people originally thought. And going back to the different soil profiles, um, how do you think they affect the taste of the Pinot that is made in those particular mm -hmm. soil types? So volcanic wine, volcanic Pinot versus marine sedimentary, there's a... Should we do that as we... It taste. As we taste? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Be because you'll, because you, it'll be you, so evident. You, so. Yes, mm -hmm. you, will, you, will, you will be able to answer this question for yourself as you're tasting these wines and relating them to the soils right. that they grow in. They're very distinctive. I guess we can, uh, if we can maybe continue talking, but uh, you can taste, um, taste through the wines as we, as we do. And um, yeah, we can look at, we, 
Should we give people clues as to soil as we go? Yes, that's a good idea. So we you have... We have tremendous amounts of handouts. But the easy way to talk about it is sedimentary, sedimentary, basaltic, basaltic. Start with El Cove, yeah. which is... And all of these binos are from 2014 vintage, which was a relatively warm vintage in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You it had a It was a warm vintage, but uh, we had three warm vintages in a row, 14, 15, 16. 14 was, I think, very round, very easy to appreciate, very quickly. Um, the wines were ready uh, very fast yeah. in the cellars. Yeah. 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 yeah, both for bottling yeah. and for drinking. Yeah. Um, 15, much less so. We, we we talked a little bit about uh, on the climate about the uh, temperatures during ripening, and that is the big difference between 14, 15, and 16. So in 14, in September, we had uh, temperatures up at 70, 27, 28, uh, but in 15, they dropped back down to, to 25, 26, 27. So um, you, you had the mono, so the, even though the, the weather was quite similar all the way up to the 1st of September, the weather in September was distinctly different and created two very different wines. And I would say in 16, even more so. And even we, more so. Yeah, the, a bigger drop in temperature um, right before harvest for 2016, which was great. It certainly was. And whilst we're on the subject of Pinot, can we talk about clones? Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to ask um, ask you, David, I guess, to talk about um, maybe we can talk about the heritage clones, um, the Pomar, and uh, then the Dijon clones that came in uh, came in a bit later, and the differences of them. So it dawned on me, I don't know, three weeks ago, when I was asked this question: Why are you using clones from Burgundy? Why don't you develop your own clones? And I pointed out to this writer that you can't actually develop clones. All you can do is select clones. And you have to have this huge genetic base in order to select clones. And that genetic base of Pinot Noir exists exactly in one place in the world, Burgundy. And why does it exist there? Because until Phylloxera, Burgundy was planted en feu, which means helter-skelter. A new vine was created by burying a, burying a cutting from an old vine. There was no rootstocks. And so this maximized the opportunity for genetic mutation by planting everything regardless of what it would, what it would give you. So I'm sure there was some selection at the same time as this multiplication process. But it was not the kind of choice that you have today between planting uh, Selection Clonal or Selection Massal. That's the only choice today because you have to put everything on a rootstock. But before Phylloxera, there, it, was, it was a heyday for genetic mutation in Pinot Noir. And up until the 18, until basically 1900, you were creating the possibility of new clones every time you planted a vineyard. But since that time, all you have is what you had. And what we had in Oregon in 1900 was nothing. What they had in Burgundy was everything. And so all we can do is make selections in Burgundy to have new clones. And it's why when um, Onivans started their work in the 1960s, uh, Raymond Bernard selected 640 selections in Burgundy and was able to plant them in a single vineyard and start comparing them and eventually make wine from a range of them that ultimately resulted in a set of clones that got nicknamed in Oregon the Dijon clones, although of course it has nothing to do with Dijon except where the administrative office of Onivans is located. And that the importation of those clones quadrupled the number of clones that we had available that we could make wine from in Oregon. Because prior to that, which was 
basically 1990 when we could start planning them. Prior to that, we only had two selections. A selection that David Lett had made in a vineyard at, uh, in Eric Wente's vineyard in Livermore, which turns out to have been clone 1A from Vadensville, and another selection that uh, was made by uh, uh, Ali in, um, I'm sorry, Olmo in, uh, at Davis when he went to Burgundy in 1945 and got a selection from uh, Chateau de Pomar uh, and brought it back and, and propagated it. So up until 1990, there were only two clones planted in Oregon, the, the clone 1A, as it was called, from Vadensville, and clone four or five that was from Pomar. So. Those were the only two clones planted oh, until 1990. Yeah. Yeah. And they continue to be planted because we're locked out. We have this great two clones that were very different from each other, not so much in crop level, but in what, what the flavors were that they gave. Pomar is what made Oregon famous and took over because it made for this ripe, lush wine that impressed everybody. The Vadensville clone was much more angular, much more austere, and allowed people to put blends between the two together, uh, which have been replicated even as we plant 113, 114, 115, 667, 777, etc., uh, going forward into the new world. The third source of clonal material, which is just getting started in Oregon, is really what had been called heritage clones in California, but can do perfectly well in Oregon as well, even if they were selected at a time to be planted in Carneros Creek Vineyard in the early 1980s, the things that have come out of that and have shown themselves to be useful in Oregon uh, work very well there. And likely <laughs> any of these Apparently. wines are gonna be a mix. Because uh -huh. even if in the years before 1980 there were monoclonal wines, most wines today, most vineyards today would not plant a single clone. That's the, the the thinking is plant multiple clones to approximate some kind of diversity and complexity. Um, there are even people that are planting a range of clones and then not marking which is where and picking it all at once, thinking that that somehow mimics Selection Massal. That doesn't, word has it even doesn't, but it feels good. <laughs> yeah, it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it isn't. So there is a shift rather than this block is 667 and this block is 777 and they're, 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 they're in sections. You're seeing people sort of grab them randomly and just put them in the ground, again, thinking that they're creating this ancient concept. Because they don't know. Yeah. And a trend that we're seeing not only in Pinot Noir, but also in Chardonnay. Oh, yeah, very much They're so. Very much so in Chardonnay. We will that. get to Chardonnay. Um, oh, I'm not allowed to talk about later. Oh, not, not, yet. Yeah. not yet. You were trying to talk about Gamay. We're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you about rootstocks as well. So if I understand correctly, there are three main rootstocks that are used in Oregon, which is a, quite a small, small amount. And, but what, um, what determines the choice of a rootstock? Is, that, uh, is it the soil? Is it the variety combination of I think things? And, cli and climate and climate. Yeah, climate, 100%. Definitely and so which, and, and which ones and, do you use? And guesswork. <laughs> guesswork. I'm, I'm 3309 and 10114. Or, yeah, yeah um, mostly on the vineyards that, that I work with. Mm -hmm. So we have devigorating on 3309. Um, is said to also uh, allow for a little bit uh, earlier ripening too. Um, and this is for our especially rich, richer soils. Um, and then 10114 for some of our, so mostly I've seen on the marine sedimentary um, in general. Um, and also on uh, more vigorous varieties, so on Gamay and also on Chardonnay. But Let's do remember that Phylloxera was discovered in 1989. Mm -hmm. So prior to 1989, only two people had used rootstocks. One was Domaine Drouin, and one was uh, John Thomas. But nobody else had planted on rootstocks. You came and visited me in 1989 and wondered what the... What everyone's up to. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I did question you then. I would never question him now, of yeah. course. <laughs> but, I, but I did then. I didn't know any better. But, but frankly, we haven't done any research. So we're, we're pretending like we know what we're doing. But... Uh, we finally last year put in 
three rootstock trials using 667 as the cyan, mm -hmm. and three different rootstocks in three different, I'm sorry, four different rootstocks in three different sites. 10 years from now, we might actually have an answer. But the, the problem is that phylloxera overtook particularly sedimentary soil vineyards so quickly that there was no research. There was no time to do the research, so all we could do was pick what we, would knew, what we knew would be safe, 3309 and 1014, 10114, which are almost identical, and plant them, and they're perfectly good. The thing that we've come to realize as we compare the few own-rooted vineyards with them is that the own-rooted vineyards ripen a little bit later okay. than that. And when we, there, there are two vineyards apparently in Burgundy, Seraphin and another one in the Cote de Nuit, that are doing research on own-rooted Pinot Noir. I, I've not talked to them, I've not been there since I heard about this, but that'll be the next time I'm Bur in Burgundy, I wanna talk to them because their belief is that own-rooted Pinot is different than grafted Pinot for making wines in Burgundy. And it's certainly been our experience in Oregon. I don't disagree, yeah. yeah. I don't disagree with that at all, yeah. yeah. The, the other rootstock you should be aware of, however, oh, yeah. is, R is, R is RG. Yeah. And in the 2000s, in the early aughts, that was uh, planted quite a bit in Oregon, used quite a bit in Oregon. And part of that is that RG uh, appears to accelerate ripening a little bit, mm -hmm. which then was an important issue in Oregon. We, we, we were having vineyards come in in late October into early November, and to be able to push them up 10 days was quite valuable at the time. Uh, a bit of a ha-ha after 14, 15, and 16, 16 yeah. when we weren't having any issues of ripening. But um, I, So most people have some, somewhat abandoned that, but again, I think that's a reaction to these warmer vintages, and we'll see um, over time whether or not abandoning RG is a good decision as well. But uh, we don't see that being used quite as much right now. People are heading back to uh, to uh, 10114 yeah. and uh, 3309. And we should also say that there is still own rooted Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in Oregon. We're sort of seeing the end of that right now. Um, um, we have a slow moving phylloxera. Uh, it's not as fast as we've seen in Europe. Um, and um, I, I get to work with some vines that were planted in the late 60s that are own rooted, but I imagine that that is not very much longer. So. And I think it's important to, the drought stress soils, mm -hmm. the sedimentary soils, like Shea Vineyard, for instance, yeah. was this classic example that he planted a vineyard and uh, toward the, I think in the middle 80s, and at the end of the 80s and into the early 90s, was devastated very quickly because mm -hmm. his soils awesome. were so dry yeah. that the phylloxera quickly um, <coughs> damaged the roots and the vines could get no water. Uh, in soils, in basaltic soils, like our original vineyard, which we planted in 71, still fine. Fine, yeah. And um, there, is, there are pockets of phylloxera that are growing, and the vines are certainly weakened, but they continue to give grapes. Do you have problems with nematodes as well? Nobody's, I mean, we've got tons of nematodes. Yeah. Uh, but mm -hmm. nobody's ever talked about anything that actually shows up. Yeah, we don't really have the sandy soils. Yeah, they love sandy they love soils sandy and we're soils. not sandy. We don't really have those soils. Okay, now we'll get into the um, individual AVAs within the Willamette Valley. And uh, this links back to the wines you've got in front of you. So I will ask um, David, I'll ask you to talk about uh, the first two, Jehalem Mountains and Ribbon Ridge. If you'll give us okay. a bit of an overview and how, what makes them special and unique and different yep. from each other. So you can see Ribbon Ridge, which is actually the second wine starting from the left. Um, that wine is from Ribbon Ridge. But what you can't see is that there are actually at least five neighborhoods that make wines that are totally different from each other. And that's this tasting that we did a week and a half ago in which we, we tried to group wines by what we thought would be different, and in all cases, Ribbon Ridge obviously was different, but that little node on the bottom right-hand side of the slide 
is Parrot Mountain. That was very different. And then if you look at that yellow backbone running down the top of Shehala Mountains, that actually is the highest level. And everything to the northeast of that is this lush soil. And regardless of elevation, that whole length of the north side was a totally different neighborhood, unlike anything else. We don't have an illustration in front of you, so you have to come back for the next uh, seminar next year, whenever we do it. Uh, but that was certainly a third neighborhood. Oh, there you go. My goodness, look at that. <laughs> we do have it. Ask and you shall people. receive. They really know what they're doing. <laughs> so you can see the lust soil on the north side there, the light tan. And that leaves two little neighborhoods. The basaltic landslide neighborhood that is sort of runs from mid-right up at an angle to the left. And the, um, the sedimentary, the darker greenish brown that is n not in Ribbon Ridge but next to it. And it's lower elevation and that is totally different too. So, as of today, we're saying there are at least five neighborhoods that are planted making wines, and a couple of them that are still pretty confusing. So the idea that this AVA is helpful at all in telling you what type of wine you would get is ludicrous. And yeah. we've known that from the beginning. Yeah. Um, so we've really, we've, we finally did the tasting that proved it a week and a half ago. And, and the question is now do we subdivide the Shayla Mountains into littler AVAs, and we're fighting a federal government that doesn't like doing that, or how do we, how do we communicate this to consumers? But Ridgecrest Vineyards in Ribbon Ridge is, very, is totally typical. It was the first vineyard planted in Ribbon Ridge, and that wine is, is really an archetype for what Ribbon Ridge wines taste like. So what do you see? Just, just to begin with, I, I'm, I hate to be taking over here, but uh, to a certain extent, the two wines on the left are, in my mind, black-fruited. The two wines on the right are red-fruited. And that's totally related to soil. Well, soil and whatever climate is at that place, and we can't differentiate that. <coughs> Just some, if anyone wants technical notes on the first wine, so you've got a few notes on, um, on the screen there, but um, probably worth adding that um, it's 40% new French oak on this, and it was aged for uh, 10 months. So this, is a, this first wine is standing in for all of the Shalem Mountains, but as I explained, there's no way to do that. The other AVAs are not quite as confusing as Shehalem Mountains. Excuse me, why, why, did they, why are you fighting a federal government or why, why do they not want to allow the development of smaller AVAs? We do, we're, we're not funding any of our uh, agencies any longer. We're right. just folding them down and letting it, our world actually, collapse right around everybody. Yeah. So. We're but actually we, funding the rich so that they can get tax breaks. Yeah, that's. Yeah, and, and they don't. Uh, that's a different to, seminar. To, yeah, it's a different <laughs> seminar. I'll <laughs> <different. laughs> that's falling into another seminar. That's yeah, another seminar. Later. But, but quite seriously, the TTB is, uh, like other agencies, is not being ma literally manned or funded by the federal government. So there's nobody there to, to pick up the phone. To pick up the phone or to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. So there are several AVAs, not just from Oregon, all sitting lined up waiting for approval, but there's nobody in the office. And just on the second wine, um, this has had 10% whole bunch um, and 47% new oak. It doesn't actually seem that, uh, um, that high. 47% new oak, but it doesn't seem that high on there. Uh, well, I mean, you do, you do smell it. And I mean, th this wine is really made for sort of midterm aging, longer aging. I mean, we haven't talked about that, but. You, I'm sure, have long since guessed that these wines are not going to fall off the edge of the earth anytime soon. Um, when we started making wine in the Willamette Valley, we, we had no vision that our Pinots would age for a long time. There was no history in the new world of, 
Pinot's aging for a super long time. And so, and, and because we were all broke, we were selling virtually everything we made and not having big back catalogs of wines. But over time, as, as we started to look at our, our libraries when, we, when they were 20 and 30 years old, these wines had gotten more complex, but they had not, they had not become old wines. And we started to realize that maybe we were not like warmer places, that something about the climate or something that we can't define was allowing these wines to hang on for a very, very long time and, in fact, get more and more interesting. And my current theory or my current statement is somebody asked me, when should I be drinking this? Well, how long do you have? But uh, 10, or 10 or 12 or 15 years is an easy answer. Uh, because these, I haven't ever had an Oregon Pinot that was having problems at that time. They're almost always better at that age. You know, the original question we started with is what drove the pioneers to, uh, to Oregon. And I don't think that we had the ability to articulate this at the time. But as we talk about wines, and certainly now in uh, Chardonnay, as we're learning about how to make better Chardonnay, there was the pursuit of acid. And I don't think that anyone in that era would have said, oh, I'm moving away from warm jammy over to cool acid. But the, but the truth is, we, we pick for acid, we look for acid, we're looking for that, that kind of racy, watery balance that you don't get in a, in a warmer climate. I don't think we would have said that in you know, 1971, but, but that's really what you see in the end, that the goal was to find these acids that had these wines, excuse me, that had better balance, and that better balance was achieved through this, this greater acid. I think the, the freshness that Eugenia brought up earlier is the one, is the sort of overlying trend, fresh, fresh fruit, fresh acid, fresh wines. Right, move on to um, Dundee Hills and uh, Yamhill Carlton. I'll ask uh, Eugenia to talk about those two regions, and we've got the AVAs, and we've got the Domaine Duran uh, Lorraine Pinot, which comes from the Dundee Hills. Oh, Dundee Hills is associated with the basaltic soils, and it is the vineyards that are planted there right now are pri primarily on those soils. There is an area you can see by the map here. It's not 100% basaltic, and naturally, as we uh, find new areas to plant grapes, we're pushing some of the Dundee Hills off to marine sedimentary. So when you're thinking about Dundee Hills, you should think basalt, but don't let yourself get fooled into thinking that, that it's exclusively such. Um, but this wine is all on basaltic soil. And I think to David's point earlier, um, you, you would get these red fruited. We, we tend to, when we talk about uh, uh, basaltic soils, we talk about all the red raspberry, uh, the different uh, cherries from tart cherry all the way over to bing cherry. But we're not looking at the blueberries. We're not looking at some of those darker darker fruits. We tend to talk in, in red fruits. Tend to have high acids, um, which brings a real, I always, I, I use musical terms. I always think of the Dundee Hills and these basaltic soils as the violins, as the string section. Whereas you get into Yamhill Carlton and you got all the cellos playing for you with all these big bass notes. It, it's a, a very different, and, and most of that's through tannin, but it's really, it's the relationship between tannin and acid. Uh, the acids in Yamhill Carlton are not so much less, but the tannins are that much more, and therefore you have a different relationship between tannin and acid. And you really can't talk about them as two separate items. They're really, they're, they're so interactive when they're in the mouth in particular. Um, what else can I say about this? This is probably made in a, this is obviously the Duran family from Burgundy. It's probably made in a very classic uh, Burgundian style. I think that if uh, I could channel Veronique for a moment, she would talk about um, the two things, the quality of the fruit that comes in, meaning the cleanliness, um, the quality of picking. is uh, um, There's a lot of, a lot of thought as, as the vines are uh, being picked. If there's any um, ugly, ugly clusters out there, they don't come into the winery. And secondly, the tannins, and the fact that the tannins in the new world tend to be uh, more mature, more physiologically ripe. And so some of the greenness that you might uh, associate with even burgundy, uh, we tend not to have that because, again, we have that, little, that warm push as we get into the final ripening period. So the tannins tend to be 
uh, rounder and more lush and more developed and less angular or, uh, or herbaceous. This wine's had 10% whole bunch and the, <coughs> the least amount of new oak of these wines, 20%. <coughs> And when I asked Veronique about this wine, actually, I asked her about, um, about yeast. And um, she's a real proponent of just using native yeast. But she did say a lot of people in Oregon use um, cultured yeast, on, uh, even on Pinot. Would you, would you agree with that? And yeah, there's a lot of interesting conversation about this right now. There's a lot of research going on. Um, obviously, the choice to inoculate or not is up to each winemaker. but. Um, a lot of evidence says that the wines are finishing with the dominant yeast, which in that case is uh, all about bought off the shelf. So that the indigenous yeast that comes in off the vineyard may start the fermentation, but it is not robust enough to finish the fermentation. Or more importantly, there are, there are yeasts in the cellar that are more robust and in fact end up finishing the, the fermentation. So there's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic right now, particularly for anybody who wants to think natural or wants to think that the yeast coming in off the vineyard is uh, actually doing all the work um, in, in the cellar. Um, I, when you inoculate, you protect yourself from some downstream risk. Um, I, I would say that a young wine might show the difference between uh, yeast strains or however you choose. I would personally say that after a wine's been in the bottle for a couple of years, you would be um, you would you would be at, at risk for pretending that you could tell the difference between the two. I, I think there are some aromatics that are associated with the kind of yeast that you use, and those show up in a young wine and, and not in an older wine. Um, but it is riskier to not inoculate. Again, an inoculation is a very a single strain and very robust, and goes in there and gets its job done right away. Kind of kills all the other yeasts and and gorges on all the sugar and then gets fat and falls over and dies. Um, it doesn't let anything <laughs> else take over. And, but <laughs> if, you have, if you're using indigenous, you've got a robust yeast for a while. It works for a little bit. Then it gorges itself, falls over to the side. The other guys come and kill it. The next yeast comes in and do it dominates for a while. So you have this, and this is part of why I think you get these more interesting aromatics, is you have multiple sets of yeast doing the work for a period of time as opposed to a more robust yeast that you uh, would use in an inoculation. But you have more risk if you do not inoculate. There was an interesting uh, piece of research done by a researcher at the University of British Columbia that was presented at the uh, Oregon Wine Symposium a month ago or three weeks ago <clears throat> in which she tried to do fermentations with only the yeast that were on the grapes. And in order to do that, she had to isolate the fermentation entirely from anything else. And she was able to accomplish that, but only in a lab, because anything that she started with, quote, native yeast, was immediately overrun by the yeasts all around it. Um, and they're, 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 in, they're on my boots. They're on the tractor. They're on our skin. They're on our skin. They're, they're on your the skin. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you, you know, if you think about these these um, lab prepared yeasts, they're robust and they're everywhere. So you, it would be impossible to create a cellar of any commercial value that could could isolate these yeasts and take them off in one single way. That's not the way the cellar is. Yeah, you don't see them floating around your cellar, but they're all there. Yeah. So the the idea that by not inoculating with a commercial yeast, that this is somehow totally unique and uninfluenced by the world of commercial yeast actually is not a true thing. Even if nobody's ever done a fermentation by adding commercial yeast, if you had somebody walk into your winery from a winery that did, you've inoculated that. And if it is a strong yeast, it is going to be in your winery. So. This whole world that we talk about inoculated versus native yeast is far, far, far more complex than what we've given it to be. The University of Washington is doing a lot of the current research on this, and, and uh, th they're working with a couple dozen different sellers, and they do just that. They take all the samples of, of uninoculated uh, products and then 
watch them uh, take uh, uh, exam, do the uh, lab work all the way through. And there happens to be one French yeast that actually is dominating everything. And, and virtually 80% of all ferments, Pinot Noir ferments, are finishing with the, the same yeast. That just happens to be very robust. Great. Thank you very much. I guess, Eugenia, if you could just say a few words on Yam Hill Carlton. Um, yeah, Yam Hill Carlton, uh, primarily sedimentary. Once again, you can see on this map with uh, the red is basaltic, but in fact, we don't have any vineyards planted on that basalt yet. They're all uh, trees there, but I can uh, imagine that if we were to look at this map in 10 or 15 years, we would see vineyards in the basalt area of Yam Hill Carlton. So now it is completely associated with marine sedimentary soils. Um, I do a lot of farming in that area, and uh, they are shallow soils, and they create very robust tannins. Um, the, my big mantra when I'm in the cellar with young winemakers is look out for the tannins, because they'll come up on you so fast you just can't figure out that they're there. So you have to be very thoughtful about how your, um, how, what your punch down uh, routine is and, and uh, your extraction routine, because these tannins uh, come Blair, as does the color, so obviously the anthocyanins as well come just blasting out you, and within 24 to 48 hours, your, your, your wines are black. I mean, they already have all their color and all their tannin, so you need to be a little bit careful. Tend to associate uh, a lot of black fruit, a lot of uh, blackberry, uh, cassis, um, even uh, uh, the ripest of the red raspberries. We tend to be very black fruited in this area. Uh, and the wines can be rustic uh, if you are not paying attention to your tannins. If you're trying to make an elegant wine, you need to really, really understand uh, during the fermentation process how to, how to hold back on those, on those tannins. Do you use any other technique other than punch down? Do you use submerged cap or? Mm -hmm. Not really. We've done a little work uh, with pump over. We have a good winemaking friend who uh, really loves the uh, gentle pump over. So. We'd done a little bit to see if we thought he was, had any good ideas or not. But no, it's generally punch down. But if you would punch down two or three times a day for the, the duration of the fermentation, we'll do twice a day for two or three days, and then we pull all the way back to once a day, um, again, uh, trying to manage the tannins. But no, it's all uh, punch down either by hand in a small tank or in a larger tank, which would be a five-ton tank, it'd be a pneumatic, uh, pneumatic device. And I don't think anybody's worked with submerged cap. Um, not with Pinot. Not with no. Pinot, no. right. No. No. Yeah. But Ms. Gamay over here mm. will get into Only submerged with cap. Only Nebbiolo, but not yeah. with Gamay. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Not with Gamay. Yeah. So I guess it's a good time to hand over to Kate. Yeah. Talk Excellent. a little um, bit about McMinnville and about Eel Amity well, and then uh, about Gamay. Gamay, yeah. Well, I'd love to start, of course, uh, well, with the Eel Amity Hills, especially since you have the, um, the Dundee Hills right next to it. So we're talking uh, two volcanic areas, uh, especially um, the Jory soil of the Dundee is, uh, is quite a lot deeper than most of the volcanic soil that we find in the Yola Amity, Amity Hills. Though there are pockets of Jory, we're mostly talking Nakaya, which is a little bit uh, less, um, less rich, a little bit less deep. Um, oh, hi guys. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and the, um, the Yola Amity Hills, of course, um, is our, uh, the furthest south that we're looking at in the Willamette Valley. Um, we have um, pretty, uh, pretty steep hills right at the top, uh, pretty high elevations. That's where you're mostly finding that volcanic soil. Um, and then dropping down um, on both the eastern and western slopes, which are both planted to, um, to mostly marine sedimentary, which is something that hasn't been discussed a lot uh, for this area, but is a huge proponent of what it is uh, in terms of flavor profile um, and plantings. Um, Kristen Vineyard is part of the Crescent. Um, if we actually go, if you go back to the slide with the map, so um, pretty obvious where the Crescent is, right? Eastern facing slope, looks like a chunk got but bitten out of it. Um, and so this is actually an area that is very specific in terms of, of climate. Um, you get to try uh, wines from the vineyards that are planted around this Crescent. Um, they all have um, some, some similarities to the Kristen that you're trying. Um, what's our um, our whole cluster on the crystal? I'm curious. Um, should be 100 percent. Yeah. yeah, it's 50 percent. 50 percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, so we're getting that a red fruitedness, but um, 
but mostly uh, because of the Van Duzer corridor, there's a lot more intensity um, and a lot more savory nature, I think, to this wine than you're seeing in the Dundee. Um, the Van Duzer corridor is, of course, the break in the coastal range that is directly to the west of the Eolami Hills, blowing this cool air in that froze Eugenia um, at night, really thickening the skins, um, uh, drying off, <laughs> drying off the, the berries in the evening, uh, and giving a density um, almost tobacco-like, sometimes a little bit tea leaf, I think, uh, to a lot of the pinot that is grown um, in this area. So when I was talking about the uh, tannins in Yamhill Carlton, uh, we have a vineyard down in Eola Amity as well, and we were making these two wines in the exact same vineyard, uh, excuse me, exact same winery, so with the same tanks, the same punch-down device, uh, same everything, and where in 24 to 48 hours in the Yamhill Carlton, you've got these deep black wines with a lot of tannin. The first time we made wine from the Zena Crown Vineyard, um, after five days, it still looked like rosé. And we were scared to death that we had done something wrong. And of course, by the eighth and ninth and tenth day, of course, it, it, had, it had color in tannin. But it gives it up so much differently. And it means that your cellar practices and the way you approach, even if you want to make similar wines or if you were to describe them in a similar way, even though the, obviously the, the vineyards and the, and the AVAs will express themselves, but uh, you really have to treat those wines uh, differently when they come in the cellar because uh, literally after four days, it's still looking light. And w we were in a total panic. But sure enough, just be patient. It will give it all up. But it, but it, took a, it was a very, very different experience. And so you don't need to be afraid of the tannins in Eola Amity. In fact, you can, you can be much more aggressive about how you want to pull extraction out from vineyards uh, in, that, in that particular area. Steve Dorner, the winemaker for Christum, is um, you know, uh, not scared of tannin in any way, shape, or form. Um, whole cluster is his signature mark, um, and I think that that really speaks to the area and to, to the grapes that are grown there. So 50% is low for him, for whole cluster. Um, you're oftentimes seeing much, much higher. Yep. Needless to say, he did a stage at the Mandu <laughs> I guess I'm just conscious of time, so I think we move on to uh, your Gamay case, oh, yeah. and, uh, um, and then Chardonnay and Pinot Gris. So the, um, the history of Gamay in Oregon is, uh, is shorter than, than Pinot Noir, of course. We're looking um, in the Willamette Valley at plantings in the 80s, uh, in the Eola Amity Hills initially, at a, at a vineyard that um, used to be called Seven Springs. Um, we have very few clones, actually, so there's the main plantings are uh, 282 and 284, um, and then uh, we're starting to bring in some of the five series too. Um, but uh, these are um, a grape that I love to work with um, and love to, to be part of the farming. Um, Gamay holds its acidity beautifully, um, and so in terms of soil type, um, it's very, very well suited for uh, the Willamette Valley in general with our, our lower pH. Um, or sorry, higher pH. Um, it also um, is a, a hardier variety, variety to work with, so um, so can withstand uh, warmer temperatures in hotter years, um, and uh, and can hang especially through the threats of of uh, rain in the in the early autumn and the mid autumn too. Um, this uh, this wine is plantings um, that were actually cut from the original planting at the Seven Springs, um, and also Eola Andy Hills in combination to transitional soils from volcanic uh, through sedimentary. Um, I guess Gamay is quite, is quite a trendy variety, <laughs> yeah. so there's a lot more of it. Um, there is, you know, um, we, we, see, we saw an interesting thing, and I'm so sure you've seen this um, in England too, um, with uh, the Beaujolais and the financial crisis of the mid to late 2000s. Um, and the plummet in price of, of the Gamay grape, um, especially in Europe, and the association with, um, with the, maybe the lesser quality of Nouveau. Um, you, see, uh, you saw basically um, sort of a, a, a market opening for higher quality to Gamay to, to, to sort of step back in, um, and this quality to value ratio, especially for restaurant lists, I would say. Um, Gamay uh, has become really popular. Um, I think that, uh, I think technically it's, from the people that I know that make it, it's a, it's a grape they love to drink. 
So uh, maybe what started off as a personal pet has now become uh, a little bit more commercialized too. Um, it's also um, part of the pioneering spirit of Oregon. We have our beautiful history of Pinot Noir, um, but we also have um, a, a relatively short history in terms of grape growing uh, with uh, a lot of curiosity added in. And so we're seeing more and more people planting uh, not only Gamay, but other varieties too. Um, in terms of uh, cellar work, there's all, all different styles of working with it, uh, with it. This is traditionally fermented, so open top, one ton, uh, one ton fermenter, so a little bit over a ton. Um, it's about 50% uh, destemmed, just a little bit underneath that. Um, um, and for me, a beautiful lens of looking into our terroir of the Willamette Valley, but just through a completely different flavor profile, a completely different grape. Um, I make this, but I also make four other single vineyard designates from the other AVAs too. Um, and, uh, and the things that we see in Pinot, we also see in Gamay, um, which is really interesting. It just reinforces the, uh, the Oregon land, basically. I have to ask you a question about yeah. that. When do we get a chance to see perhaps either yourself or a combination of you guys get together and do some PDGs? Because I'm, I'm coming from Canada, and we're starting to see that in the Okanagan Valley. Uh, a little bit more often, even in small lots. You said and, BTGs? Yeah, past your friends. So oh, we're doing like 50 50. Yeah. Sorry. So we are um, seeing that actually. Okay. Um, so uh, in the next seminar, there's going to be a Gemme Pinot combo from Rhin it's called Rhinestones. It's by Bow and Arrow. I make a Gemme Pinot that's called Cascroute that I mostly keg um, and, the, and that's sort of a glass pourable wine. Um, but also, um, it's definitely, you know, it's a def different section of our market. Um, it's, uh, th these are, um, the, what we're t tasting now is beautiful wines of prestige, you know, the wines to lay down. And, um, and, but that's not everything that Oregon does. Um, but seeing as, I mean, you, this, not everybody gets the chance to taste Oregon wines in general. This is the, the greatest way to, to start. So, uh, but those wines are definitely coming and, and in quantity. Um, um, it's just a matter of time, I think, for, you, for them you just to see them outside of the U.S. And this brings us on to the white grapes. So we have um, Chardonnay and Pinot Gris here. You actually have three Chardonnays, not two. Um, so the, um, the glass closest to you is the Adelsheim Chardonnay, which somehow didn't make it onto the presentation, but it's here. So, but David's here, so he's going to talk about yeah. it. But, with Chardonnay, I guess um, I wanted um, to talk about the history of Chardonnay and um, the trials and tribulations of the clones, etc. Because at the beginning, there was much more Chardonnay grown in Oregon, and now it's about sixty percent. Uh, sorry, six percent of plantings. But I understand it's on the up again. And um, David, could you maybe talk about the old, old clones and uh, the Dijon clones that you that you brought in and uh, how it's changed? Yeah. Uh, Chardonnay is a as I said way back at the beginning, was one of the three varieties that were planted, but ran into the problem that there was a style of Chardonnay being associated with the new world that we couldn't make. And so it really, it not only dimmed in terms of percentage, but literally the quantity, the number of hectares uh, was diminished in, in the 90s, uh, and the literal amount of Chardonnay planted was going down. Um, once the clones from Burgundy could be planted, though, uh, it coincided with something else that was going on. And that was the beginning of a recognition, particularly by younger drinkers, that there was a different, that, that Chardonnay, big, oaky, alcoholic, ripe Chardonnay, was not the only wine that was white that you could drink. And as people went through and anything but Chardonnay, period, one of the principal varieties to be benefited by anything but Chardonnay was Chardonnay in Oregon. Um, as people discovered that where you grew grapes actually mattered. And so Oregon Chardonnay started taking off at roughly the same time that the clones came from Burgundy. And at this point, it is the percentage wise, it is the fastest growing variety in the Willamette Valley. Um, 25% of the grapes have not yet borne fruit. So it, the, 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 the style of wine that are being made by the two wines on your right and the wine that is sitting in its spare glass is sort of the, 
the newer wave. Now, the, the, the two Chardonnays are a current vintage and an older vintage, and then the other spare Chardonnay from us is a current vintage. So, talking of the styles of Chardonnay, so I guess, um, are we moving towards the more reductive uh, Australian fuel styles of Chardonnay in Oregon? Uh, well, not Australian, but certainly um, because we can't we can't mimic <laughs> that climate. Um, no, I think I think I think the the clones gave us the possibility of picking earlier, and then the 2011 vintage with a number of our tarp sh top Chardonnay producers going to Burgundy and realizing that they were picking earlier than anybody ever imagined, and. So the, the newest, the, the, the two things that are going on in Chardonnay today are reductive winemaking and religious reductive winemaking, if you will. Um, and then that matched with ever earlier picking so that instead of uh, picking for 12 or 13 percent alcohol, we're now down in 11 and even lower capitalizing if necessary, but picking for acidity more than for ripeness. And I think in reductive winemaking, also vessel choice too. So we're seeing larger and larger oak, uh, so punch and above in terms of style. So oak influence becoming structural versus flavor. Um, it's quite interesting to have an older Chardonnay in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, it's 2006. <laughs> It's quite a right vintage. Mm -hmm. Warm yeah. <laughs> so this, this wine is made in a sort of Chablis style, I guess. 50% um, of the fermentation is in stainless steel and 50% um, in, um, in old, older oak. So there isn't a huge amount of new oak. I think it's literally 10%. Um, so Veronique makes this very much in a, in a Burgundian style and always has. She hasn't really changed the way she makes this wine. Sure. It's 50-50 oak and nada. Yeah, right? exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And 100% Dijon clone. So here it's uh, 76 and 96 clone. Which, again, with Chardonnay, we started with clones that, in the Chardonnay case, there, there was one selection that David Ladd had made that actually is probably pretty good. But most of us planted uh, virus-free clones that really never got ripe. <laughs> And have are mostly now either taken out or have been dwarfed by the clones, the clones from Burgundy. Uh, Seventy six and ninety five or ninety six um, are kind of the preferred. There are a range of other things, and and more newly, Kate, you can talk about. Yeah, what's no, going I, some, on. so some of the older plantings. Um, so we're talking so one hundred eight, um, and then you have a little bit of Mendoza, um, also, and and Draper. Um, which is David Lett, of course. Um, and then, um, you know, late ripening clones that didn't get ripe 50 years ago. Um, but moving, I think, towards um, so the combination of multiple uh, clonal selections within vineyards, um, uh, especially, um, I think, a, a big focus on 108 um, is coming back, too. So, yeah. And I guess, David, you can talk about your uh, um, Ribbon yeah. Springs Vineyard Chardonnay. If you compare the Stoller with our Chardonnay, they're both, uh, they're not the same vintage. Stoller's 15, we're 16. But the Stoller is, in fact, a single vineyard from their vineyard in basaltic soil in the Dundee Hills. And this is a single vineyard from one of our vineyards in Ribbon Ridge, the sedimentary soil. So uh, you really start to see the distinctiveness more of where these wines are coming from than in how the wines were made. Neither one of these were picked in this new wave really early sense. They're both, I suspect, fully ripe, sort of potential 12 and a half, 13, um, and balanced use of new wood probably in the 20 or 25% new wood level. Um, malolactic uh, in both of them, but perhaps not full. Um, but having said that, they are very different wines, more because of where they came from than the one year of difference in age.
The one thing uh, that I find interesting is that um, in Pinot Noir, we've been making it a long time. We have a lot of vocabulary. Um, we are pretty capable of articulating the difference in the soil types and how they express themselves in the wines. And we're just learning that in Chardonnay. And this is probably one of the most, one of the best examples, and I'm very excited for myself <laughs> to see this, but the Stoller being from the basaltic soil and the Ribbon Ridge, or the Adelsheim from uh, Marine Sedimentary, you can taste the tannin in the Ribbon Ridge. It, the back, there's a tannin backbone in there that, that is definitely coming from the grapes, whereas you look at the Stoller and it has a little bit more of that back to the violins, that sort of piercing acidity and there's, there's the same kind of acidity in the Ribbon Ridge, but it's a little more mouth coat from, from those tannins. And I think this is one of the better examples that I've seen in front of me where I, I can now pick out the soil types in these two wines, where it's not easy in Chardonnay because it's more about acid and it's, it's less about the, the, the fruit flavors, which are the descriptors that we use in Pinot. So it's a little bit more elusive here, but I think you can really see it in these two wines. And I think, you know, with that tannin um, also comes a, just a beautiful salinity in, in the Edelsheim. It's gorgeous. I mean, and it sort of plays together right in the end of mouth. And that's something that, um, that, I, that I have been encountering more and more with our marine sedimentary soils is this actual little tiny backbone that you get of, of, of salt in general, um, especially with older vines. Um, but, uh, but a note that when I first started making wine in Oregon, um, I, I didn't think about that much or didn't, maybe well, I wasn't tasting as much, but sort of echoes through the marine sediment soils. Once upon a time, we thought that Chardonnay belonged on basaltic soils because it would develop the kind of fruit that you see in both of these first two Chardonnays, um, particularly in the Stoller, which is obviously ripe and, and really intense. Um, and, and I think we shied away from the droughtier sedimentary soils, thinking that that would result in wines that had less fruit. But it's not so much that it's less fruit than changed fruit. There is this much higher citrus level in... in lemon, always lemon, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and certainly one of the, the, uh, the trendiest of Chardonnay producers in the Willamette Valley right now, Josh Bergstrom, is now contending that he thinks um, uh, that the sedimentary soil Chardonnays are, are really going to be the future of the Willamette Valley. So, uh, you know, once upon a time, or uh, not once upon a time, uh, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, I've been asked, <laughs> what's, what's, the next, yeah, really, what's the next hot variety in Oregon? And uh, of course, it's Chardonnay. The, the, yeah. It's Chardonnay, it just yeah. is. Yeah. And, and obviously, also, Pinot, because it's 74% and growing. So it's as much as we love, and winemakers are probably the worst on the universe of loving to play with new things, uh, varieties and whatever, but. There's been a beautiful reinvention of Chardonnay. Um, and so it is a new thing. And the wines are fantastic. The wine, they're amazing, yeah. And this brings us on to Pinot Gris, which is still the most um, planted white but, um, and we're going to correct that. Yeah, I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, I guess, Eugenia, maybe you could talk about this and then we and talk about your work in the uh, Pinot I can, Gris. I can talk about this, and I'm embarrassed that I have to. Um, I really don't like Pinot Gris. Neither do I. Just, <laughs> just going to put it out there. And uh, in uh, 2016, my company bought the Willikensee estate. And my first assignment was to make a Pinot Gris, and I thought I was being punished for something. Um, and, uh, but one, one thing I knew is that so Pinot Gris is an unusual uh, situation in that if you pick it in the area of uh, alcohol where you'd like to drink it, so in the low 12s maybe or something like that, or even the high 11s, low 12s, the, 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 the grapes are, are just herbaceous and they're, 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 boring. They're, they're boring and they're actually <laughs> unpleasant. So when you get Pinot Gris ripe enough to actually have some flavor, which tends to be sort of the tropical fruit type of thing, you've got uh, alcohols up in the 13 and a half and 14. So it's a real, it's a real dichotomy on how, how do you make this wine uh, come together for you. So my answer would be have it go away altogether. 
um, <laughs> but uh, I didn't have that choice in this particular vintage. So my goal here was to make a Pinot Gris that um, still had plenty of acid and it had some fruit expression, but it wasn't um, over the top. And I did this by using uh, grapes picked at different, at different ripeness. That was the way I got around that. So I could pick a little later for flavor uh, and to have enough alcohol for mouthfeel and earlier to keep the acidity bright. Um, and I think you would find this a little on the herbaceous side, a little on the almost Sauvignon blanc side, if I were to give it another uh, a nickname for it. But the goal here was to try and make a wine that I would actually drink if there was <laughs> no other wine available to me. <laughs> Desert Island. <laughs> yeah, my, my, desert, yeah, desert yeah, island my punishment, Desert, desert Island wine. <laughs> yeah. Is there a lot of Pinot Grigio style um, um, Pinot Gris made in, in Oregon? Is that... Uh, I, I, think the, I think that the, the example for, for Pinot Gris in, in Oregon was more Alsatian or French. And as somebody who's made it for years, you can speak to that better than I can. Well, I was just going to say that, that Willamette we sort of, I explained the problem with Chardonnay, the, the, that there was no market for what we made and we didn't really understand what we were doing. And Pinot Gris had been planted by David Lett from the beginning and people tried it and sort of exclaimed they'd never heard of the grape variety. It was before Pinot Grigio was a big deal, either here or in the States. And King State came along and started planting a lot of it in the mid 80s uh, or late 80s even. and made a winery based on Pinot Gris and the variety took off all over the Willamette Valley. And it's still 15 or 16 percent of what's planted. But virtually none of it is being planted today as Chardonnay starts to take center stage and be the, the point of excitement for people. Pinot Gris is sort of is losing that reason for being. You're and starting to see, I mean, people play with fermentation style a little bit more with Pinot Gris, so more I, I, you know, skin, skin I, I contact, mean, amphora. I mean, you know. part, of the, part of the problem, though, the big, the big picture problem with Pinot Gris is that as much as we will look to Grand Cru vineyards of Pinot Gris and Alsace like Rangen and things like that, even in Alsace, Pinot Gris has trouble, um, except in those Grand Cru vineyards. And the idea that we could plant Pinot Gris in our vineyards and sort of automatically make world-class wines from it, I think is pretty presumptuous of us. And I don't know that we've created those kinds of wines. We've in essence made something that is neither Alsatian nor Italian. It is truly Oregonian or Willamette Valleyan, if you will. And it's fresh, lively, and at its best can, can be a lovely wine for swigging. The problem with that is the same problem that, that New Zealand realized with Sauvignon Blanc and other people have realized with other grape varieties is that it doesn't matter who made it. It is totally generic. And thus the winery cannot hang its hat on making Pinot Gris. King Estate finally realized that having invested all this money at Pinot Gris cookbook and dishes and all this stuff, that at its best, it tasted really close to our Pinot Gris, and if they ran out, people would buy ours, or 54 other wineries who made Pinot Gris. And and our, our soils are, are special enough to be dedicated to, to other things. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Great, good and and speaking of other things, if you do see Oregon Pinot Blanc, <laughs> please don't dismiss it. The Pinot Blanc grown in Oregon is very special. Super, super gorgeous wine. So don't, yeah, if you don't, don't, don't mix one with the other. The Pinot Blancs are, are really lovely, whereas Pinot Gris is, to David's point, doesn't really matter who makes it. We just have a couple of slides on labeling regulations in Oregon, and I guess how. <laughs> the guy who the, created the, the, them. The guy who created them. <laughs> So briefly, b back in uh, the 70s, when the wine industry was founded, the federal government had rules on a number of things, like what percentage of a grape variety needed to be in a wine in order to name it after that grape variety. And in those days, it was 
<clears throat> so you could have, as obviously you could have Pinot Noir 51% and who knows what for the other 49. When Didn't we, even have to be red. No, it could be anything. There was, a, it was literally a, an atrocious period for American wines legally. Not necessarily the wine, but legally there was no regulation. Um, we, we were offended by that. <clears throat> and again, we were very idealistic when we started, and we determined that we would have much stricter, stricter regulations. We were concerned, for instance, that people would bring grapes from outside of Oregon, bottle them, and be able to pass their wine off as Oregonian because it was made there. We put in a, in a requirement that all the grapes needed to be from Oregon. Uh, we were offended that people would use names like Champagne and Burgundy and Beaujolais, so we prohibited the use of those terms, and on and on to the fact that we required 90% of the grape variety in a wine be from what it says it was on the label. We excluded a couple of grape varieties that were traditionally blended and would make it very hard, like Cabernet and Merlot and uh, a few others, and that was expanded later on. Um, but our quest today, and you heard it first here, is that we are pushing for, in the Willamette Valley, that any wine labeled, uh, labeled Chardonnay or Pinot be entirely from that grape variety. And, and that's also something, that, that's a differentiation between the Willamette Valley and Oregon. Uh, and so some, that, uh, the, of course, we are in Oregon, but there is a, a distinct difference between the wines of the Willamette Valley and the wines that are labeled as Oregonian. And we have a couple of slides on environmental uh, sustainability. Um, we talked about this a bit earlier. So I'm going to skip this, but there's one thing I wanted to ask you, um, and which might be interesting for all the MW students in the room. Is there a succinct way of explaining the three-tier system um, in the US? <laughs> might be quite, quite useful for our... Uh, Before uh, we go right there, I, just, I do want to just point out line. that what we use as our sustainability organization in Oregon is called LIVE, L-I-V-E. And I'm showing this because here's an example of a LIVE logo on the Duran bottle. So if you see this, this is the, the logo for LIVE. Uh, sustainable growing in Oregon. The low in viticulture and enology. So my explanation for the three-tier system is that imagine that every state is its own country and that we have to try and sell in each of those countries and we have to have a representative in each of those countries. We inherited <laughs> a lot of crap from the UK, <laughs> <coughs> particularly as controls on alcohol. Mm -hmm. Uh, you luckily avoided the terror that was prohibition. You did not. Um, prohibition uh, and the excesses of alcoholism and, and violence on women and, and all sorts of other things prior to prohibition uh, resulted in a, a truly puritanical approach to how alcohol would be managed. And even as prohibition ended because it was unmanageable, the states, each of these now 50 states, were given the right to Choose their manage own. sales of alcohol. And some of them were very strict, prohibiting it. In fact, having monopolies like exist in most of Canada. Uh, other states were freewheeling and, and allowed anybody to do anything. Other states have sort of friendly neighbor agreements too. So if you're in a neighboring state, then there's no, the laws don't apply. So, well, less. <laughs> so it's. In essence, if you were going to do an MW based on U.S. wine law, good luck. <laughs> I guess as a, as a result of these complexities and um, the fact that the Oregon industry is so small, I imagine lots of the small wineries do direct to consumer, and that's very important to your business. Yeah, there's also just to, to back up, when this all started, you had, and I apologize, these numbers are not accurate, don't write them down. But you had 10,000 distributors and 500 wineries. And it's the opposite. So there was a plenty of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now you have 500 distributi distributors and 10,000 wineries. So that, that pyramid has completely changed. And I have been a distributor, and I'm going to tell you point blank that we could, we, our goal is to sell a certain number of boxes a month. That's what brings you the revenue to keep the lights on. And I don't care if it's your wine or your wine or your wine. I don't care what it says. So a distributor's goal is to sell a certain number of boxes to get a certain amount of revenue. 
and it is completely irrelevant what the wine is. Now, there are passionate people in the distribution tier, don't get me wrong, who love wine, care about wine, become brand ambassadors, and are really fine wine salesmen. But the owners, the business people, at the end of the day, it's just about the revenue that you get in the door to keep everything functioning, keep your trucks moving, etc. So for small wineries that make a small amount of reasonably expensive wine and don't have the money to help financially so that if the case is $100, I'll give you $5 for every case you sell. Well, small wineries don't have the money to subsidize like this. They don't have the money to give you tickets to um, whoever, you know, the Manchester soccer game. They don't have money to fly you out to the winery and, do, and, and show you the area. So it becomes a very um, un, un, uneven playing field. So bigger, bigger wineries, bigger companies can afford to do a lot more. And naturally, they therefore get the attention of the distributor. So you just don't have enough bandwidth on the distribution level to, to take all of these small wineries and push them back out to the, to, to the gatekeepers. And by law, these wines have to tra go through all of these steps into the warehouse, all the billing, all the exchange of money. This is, it all has to go through this uh, antiquated, antiquated system. So to Lincoln's point, the D to C direct to consumer business in Oregon is robust, very robust. Before we leave the three tier system, one of the biggest problems that the three tier system has foisted on America is that it has made every bottle of wine one third more expensive than it is anywhere else in the world. And it, it, it totally shadows or shades how American produced wines are perceived anywhere else because they're often one third more expensive because the whole system has been created around that three tier system. And it also cuts the selection down. So you know, here you have the combination of not only are you paying more money for the wine, but you're, you have uh, much less um, availability of wine. So your choice as a consumer is cut down dramatically because n many of these uh, wineries simply aren't getting to market. I found that there's been a push towards working more so with, with, with smaller wineries, people who are less known, uh, l less spoken about, and there seems to be less interest on the buyer's side about whether or not they're going to be flown out to wherever or taken to whatever. The, the key tends to be more about uh, scarcity, whether you like it or not, because what we're noticing is that there's perhaps maybe just the same level of scarcity in Oregon State Pinot as there would be in Burgundian Pinot. Um, given the distribution channels, right? <clears throat> but, you know, where I'm coming from in Western Canada, uh, <coughs> my clients are very, very interested in dealing with Oregon State uh, over Burgundy for three reasons. Number one, although you may consider your prices to be a bit higher, um, they don't even come close to what the Burgundians are charging on an every year increasing level. Uh, number two, the quality seems to just continually get better over and over and over and over. Um, but the only area that we found as distributors that could easily help you, and I don't know if this is a, an, o an okay discussion to have, is just to be a little bit more flexible with, with people. Like, I'm a small agency, so I'm falling into the category of being a very passionate individual with respect to that. That's the reason I'm here. But um, beyond that, I'll, I'll tout, I, I won't speak to whom I represent within Oregon State, but I will tout that all day long, and it's been very successful. In my marketplace, uh, people find uh, a gem that is much harder for them to get, but much higher quality and lower price than other parts of the world, and they're ecstatic, they're over the moon. And where I'm coming from, it's easy to get there. I mean, you work with one of my colleagues as well. I do, but I think that there's a di this is a dichotomy of the wine industry, though, is we have small batch, hand-produced uh, wines that are priced as such, and then you have commodity wine at the end of the day. And how do you, how do you merge those two things into one industry? We, but, but we do, no, and we, <laughs> but we don't, and we, but it is, no. but it is. And we look for <laughs> distributors like you. Yeah, there, exactly. There mm -hmm. are those small distributor pockets around the U.S., and you know, we, everybody looks for those particular distributors. So it's not that they don't exist. It's just very hard for them to exist. Um, and Make so no mistake, I understand that. You see more and more people <laughs> becoming distributors also, but then, you know, how many accounts does, you know, do you want to hold it? The whole system is, you know, it's growing, but it's 
it's going very fast. I think the I think the one thing that is happening um, slowly in the states, it doesn't really have a direct effect on you, but it will eventually, is that we are becoming more like Britain in terms of a much more complex market. Mm -hmm. I think I think the three tier system. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the three tier system is doomed because because it cannot deal with all the small producers. But is it too and, big to fail? I'm sorry? But is it too big to fail? Well, it's That's too big. That's the thing. Uh, maybe in your lifetime. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, for our kid, but, for kids of kids. But, well, but I think I, I, right now it is a system that is supported by this governmental distribution relationship. The government looks to the distributors to collect the individual state taxes on it. And as long as that exists, most states that don't have a wine industry need or think they need the three-tier system. But slowly, I mean, Washington has come very close to abandoning the three-tier system because Costco forced them to do it. And there will be other states that start to do that. Washington, D.C., for instance, is exactly like the U.K. Anybody can buy, can import, can do anything can at any anybody. level. Um, and something also to remember is that America is a relatively young wine-consuming country. These are things that are, don't have the longest of histories, um, and so we are making our way. Um, and it, yeah, there is room for change, but no. And that's a different seminar. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> after the gambling seminar. After the gambling seminar and after the political seminar. Thank one. you very much for, uh, for all of this. I mean, I, yes, that's why, that's a <laughs> good discussion. Um, I don't know if we have time for uh, a couple of questions. Has anyone got a question, Ray? Could you just tell us, um, through Gamay and Chardonnay and Pinot, just very briefly, the temperature that you manage, the temperature management through each variety, mm -hmm. briefly? Uh, so for, for Gamay, um, cool ferments, um, uh, I, I'm looking, I, I do some in cement also, so that those can be in sort of the 19, 20, 21. Um, mostly looking for no high spikes, so trying not to get above you know, 25, 26. Um, but, but relatively the same um, in terms of, of, of I guess, but for Pinot, too. I mean, yeah. And I think there was a period in the 90s and early aughts where new winemakers were trying to make a name for themselves, and they would do a number of things, more new wood, riper picking, but higher fermentation temperatures that would give bigger, Esters richer and... wines. But as as the sort of ethos of cool climate started to resonate more and more, even, evil, even people like that, Beaufair would be a great example, for instance, of somebody that is back, way back from this arguably big style mm -hmm. to something that is based on lower fermentation temperatures and lower ripeness, less new wood, all of these things that work in, uh, uh, together. The Chardonnay is a barrel ferment for, for me, so it's cellar temperature. My cellar is freezing cold. Um, in, in Fahrenheit, uh, it can drop to 49, sort of sits around the 54, yeah, 57 level. And so my Chardonnay ferments are a full year, ticking along, which is great. Slow. Um, but don't but don't freak out. <laughs> so. Yeah, but remember not to freak, <laughs> freak out. out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> By April and May, and don't, don't freak, freak out. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's the watchword. Yeah, I think uh, Chardonnay, certainly there are those people who are using stainless steel, uh, whether it's in a part of the program or all of the program. So those are going to be cool ferments that are truly chilled, and they're going to be in under 10. And then, uh, and then the regular barrel fermentation is going to be cellar, cellar temp, so 14, 15. That you battle with in um, in your cellar. How, how do you control that? Because you said the tannins come out great. Not, the not color. with temperature. Not with temperature. With extraction. To moderate. The temperature. Yes. It's, yeah. It's it's through extraction. Temperature. We don't use temperature as a way of modifying the tannin. Any more questions? But actually, two. Um, first is, how can we get hold of the information about the tasting that you mentioned last week, where you identified all the AVAs and subregions? And the second, if I may, um, what about sparkling wine? Mm. I mean, I make sparkling wine. You make sparkling wine. wine. I make sparkling wine. I make sparkling wine. The easy one first. Um, 
there is a new wave of sparkling wine production for obvious reasons. The planting of Pinot and Chardonnay, um, most, uh, obviously one of the biggest impediments has been availability of uh, the, all the equipment that is needed to make it. And once uh, there, was, there was a sparkling producer that started in the mid 80s, Argyle, incredible wines. Um, and they have someone that has now offshot and is helping with some of the sparkling production, a mobile unit. Yeah. Andrew. 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 So <laughs> we, <laughs> once Andrew, Andrew left, he figured there was a need by other wineries to use that. And so we could start with uh, one or 100 or 200 or 300 cases of sparkling wine and not have to spend uh, $200,000 to buy equipment. Um, I think it's going to... It's going to be introduced slowly and mostly direct to consumer, but I would expect that um, that even importers in the UK would start to get a hint of this. It's certainly not the same style as UK sparkling wine. I'm guessing that the style that will arrive in Oregon right now, it's too early to even know. There hasn't even been a tasting of all these things, but I'm guessing that it will be slightly riper yeah, than the UK riper. style of but not as ripe as the typical New World style. And I was just a little bit more on the on, like front fruit, um, which is you know something that we see anyway in our still wines, but it can be more pronounced in sparkling. I make pet nat um, from Grenache from Southern Oregon. Um, I make a Cremant um, from Shannon from Washington. Um, and I make a Brut Rosé uh, in 2013. And it's vintage, it's, for us, it's vintage specific too. I don't, uh, the pet nat I make every year, um, but using the higher end grapes is something that I've, it's just based on the year and what we're seeing the vineyards come in at. Um, Dundee Hills was my first vintage of Brut Rosé, so Méthode Traditionnelle. Um, and then I'm doing a Rosé, but Pinot Meunier, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir from a southern Willamette Valley, so near Eugene. Um, so old plantings um, uh, of a spot that has a little bit of some frost issues. So, so we're, we're going to be taking uh, fruit off of that in the right years to make it. The other question that you asked, um, there is some work being done specifically on this uh, topic that hopefully will find its way into a seminar format um, that will be drilled down with the proper wine examples, et cetera. So um, I would like to think that in four to six months, we would see something um, uh, that would be a little bit um, a little bit Willamette Valley centric, but it would be an AVA. It would be an AVA conversation that would drill down much more than what we were able to do today. So that tasting that we did a week and a half ago was at the behest of a writer who had been hired by the Willamette Valley wineries to put together the seminar that Eugenia, excuse me, for reading, the seminar that Eugenia, yeah, okay, good, uh, had had asked uh, had mentioned, but. One of the things that came out, we, we in the Shalem Mountains knew that we had these neighborhoods. We didn't necessarily know how they were defined, but we knew that the wines were so all over the place that we couldn't pretend that there was a Shalem Mountains style of wine. So we divided this tasting up by neighborhood. Other, other appellations, other AVAs haven't really been forced into this conversation because the existence of so much soil that is different um, has sort of, the conversation hasn't gone there. But I, while I wasn't in the Dundee Hills uh, tasting, they, they said to Elaine, who was asking for this tasting, please come back, we want to do, the, we want to do a neighborhood tasting too. So the, the genesis of this was exactly the tasting that you're referring to. Yeah. And yeah. so for the MW visit in May, um, a winemaker from each appellation got together. I was Yamhill Carlton, and we had more fun. Oh my God, did we have fun! We was like, can we do this every month? And we took <laughs> we took 2010 was yeah. the vintage, and we we got a a, lo a large number of wines. We might have had 25 wines from an AVA, and 2010 was back a little bit. So you had producers that weren't in business yet. You had people who didn't have a cellar deep enough to do this. But we were just blown away, and we, our job was to narrow the, Our first job was to say, do we really have AVAs that, that, that we can 
we can speak to with, with passion and authenticity, I think was the first thing. Because we weren't really as positive ourselves. So this was completely technical. Everything was blind, drilled down. And it was amazing how you could say, this wine doesn't fit at all. And sure enough, you'd look at something and go, oh, they gave us the wrong wine. Or it's really interesting, or hmm, they put the wrong, that label might not be accurate. Um, but it was, it, was, it was our own learning curve. And we, six winemakers, literally, we did it over two days. And it was a three-hour tasting that went on for it's seven hours because we were having so much fun learning, helping ourselves learn. And we really said, well, let's, ne let's get together next month and do 2011. I mean, we were so excited about it. And we drilled it down to the seminar that you attended. And I was telling Elaine that story, and that was where, can I see that? So it was done by Appalachian, and everyone took it a little bit more or less seriously. It, naturally, David he headed up Shehalem Mountains and Ribbon Ridge, so it was super drilled down every possible map and statistic and analysis that you could imagine. Some AVAs were put together a little bit more quickly. But I think that the result of that was that everybody participating realized that we had something that we needed to explore and really nail down and be put into a presentable format. So I think that over the next year, you will start to see a lot more of that coming out of uh, the Willamette Valley, certainly. And I hope that infects all of our, the rest of Oregon. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Well, there's one, uh, there's one more. Oh, there's one more question. <laughs> one little question about the label ability. Uh, availability. I wonder if you see, regard that as an increasing problem, or it's sort of a relieved uh, thanks to uh, maximize the automation in pruning or harvesting, harvesting, etc. What was the first, the lab? Uh, the labor ability. Labor, the labor. availability. Yeah. Uh, yeah, labor availability is is definitely an issue. Um, some of it is the government issues that are going on, uh, but some of it is just that the traditional worker, all Hispanic in our vineyards, is getting older and either they are retiring, their children are not particularly interested in that kind of work, and also the uh, Mexican economy is um, far more robust than it was 40 years ago, and so there's not necessarily the reason to leave to get better jobs. So that labor force is dwindling. There is no substitute uh, labor force available. You see much more. Uh, if we weren't on camera, I'd say something else. Um, <laughs> but we are. Uh, but we mechanical work is what we're looking at. Uh, but pruning is a skill. It's practically an art. And uh, I believe me, I wouldn't just hand somebody a pair of pruning shears and send them out there to play in my vineyard. So pulling brush, maybe not, not so skilled, um, but we have to find a way to deal with this uh, issue going forward. Lots of things can be done mechanically without any negative effect whatsoever, um, particularly for quality, and that's our concern is quality. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that maybe robots become part of it, I, but we don't have an answer, but it is definitely an ongoing pressure. Uh, something, uh, having made wine in, in a couple of different regions, the amount uh, that is done by hand in Oregon is oh, it's, it's it's absolutely incredible. It's virtually all. It's everything's done. In, yeah, it, 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 the Willamette Valley, especially. Um, it's uh, it's um, it's a testament to the quality, I think. So. But we're learning to use machines for leaf pulling. Um, a little bit of experimentation with harvesting. Most of us have uh, experiments in our cellar. You know, we'll do a, a vineyard with three different harvesters and by hand and. You know, hand always wins. I'm sorry, it just does. And we don't know what we're tasting. It's all done blind. But, uh, but there are a couple of machines that are really close, very hard to tell the difference, a couple of machines that are really awful. Um, so we'll just have to see. But it's forcing us to rethink how we do stuff.